This program is rated GE. Content carried in here is suitable for general family viewing. Matters a show that is entertaining, informative, and offers legal aid in our day to day lives. Tonight, we're looking into the issue of international law. How has it been applied in Kenya before and after the promulgation of the 2010 Constitution? What are some of the strikes that have been made, the treaties that have been signed, and whether they have been binding here in the country? Remember, you can send in your feedback, your questions on our social media platforms at KUTV Kenya on Facebook, at KUTV underscore Kenya on Twitter, and KUTV Kenya on YouTube. My name is Irene Mwangi, but before we get into the integrity of this particular discussion, let me allow my guest to introduce himself kindly. Thank you. Thank you, Irene, uh, for having me. Uh, my name is Haman Omiti. Um, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a partner at uh, the law firm of Gary Omiti and Bush Advocates, mm -hmm. also known as NOB Advocates LLP, mm -hmm. uh, here in Nairobi. I'm very glad to uh, be, be here today and to engage uh, in this topic of discussion for today. All right, thank you for making time. Now, looking into the issue of international law and with the um, um, you know, avoidance of, you know, sounding cliche. What, what is international law? Because it's a, it is a term that has been used every now and then, but really getting um, the perspective of what it really means. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, international law um, uh, simply means a, a body of rules. Mm -hmm. um, rules and principles that govern um, relationships between states. Mm -hmm. um, their interactions, be it uh, uh, diplomatic interactions, uh, be it in terms of environment, be it in terms of human rights. Uh, so generally, uh, there are those principles and rules that have been laid down by states mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, states um, uh, decide by their own volition to be part of mm -hmm. and give their um, authority that they would be bound mm -hmm. by those uh, rules and principles. Okay. Yes. Is it, um, is the law a one fit all in terms of all, uh, you know, the, the, the states in the continent are bound by this one rule? Or does it change given the dynamics of different states, say the African continent, the European continent? How does it border? Um, there are no one fit all um, uh, laws in that respect. Uh, in international law is varied. Um, so we have international law at the international level where we have the United Nations Charter, mm -hmm. uh, where m uh, states are members of the United Nations. Now, under the United Nations, there are various laws mm -hmm. uh, that are, um, states come up with uh, mm -hmm. from time to time. These laws, uh, they come up with because of certain necessities. Uh, for instance, uh, when there are issues of um, uh, global warming, um, they come up with certain laws to deal with the environment. Mm -hmm. If there are issues uh, to do with the uh, genocide and international uh, war crimes and all that, they come up with certain laws to deal with those. Mm -hmm. and, and so the laws um, are created at, at different times. Mm -hmm. uh, within the African continent, we have the African Union, uh, which has different uh, laws that govern the interactions uh, within the, um, the, the African um, uh, continent mm -hmm. um, and uh, cascading it down even to the East African community, where we have East African community laws mm -hmm. that govern the relationship relationships of these countries within the East African community. Yeah. Um, so there are laws at different levels, mm -hmm. and of course uh, these laws are um, uh, enacted at different uh, times depending on the needs uh, of the states, uh, mm -hmm. what they need to address. They come up with certain laws to ensure that these issues are taken care of. All right. Yeah. Now, away from the broad perspective in terms of um, the convention that bring about the international law, yeah. what is the legal framework? for the country? Um, uh, Kenya is a member of the international community and 
the international community, as we've said, operate within a certain legal framework. And so Kenya fits within that framework. Okay. Uh, but of course, there's a question of sovereignty of states. And so each state then accepts to be bound by these laws. Mm -hmm. And they choose which ones uh, they accept to be bound by. And so Kenya, as a sovereign state, um, also has its own rules uh, that gives it the authority um, and, and gives the uh, government the authority to ratify uh, certain laws that apply to us. Um, so in Kenya, uh, before the 2010 constitution, mm -hmm. um, these laws were applicable under the general rules mm -hmm. um, of ratification of uh, treaties, and then they would apply um, uh, here. But uh, there was a shift when the 2010 constitution uh, was promulgated, uh, where we enacted Article 2. Uh, article 2, sub Article 5 and 6, which then um, uh, specified that uh, treaties that are ratified by Kenya become part of our laws and that the general principles of international law are also directly applicable uh, in Kenya. Uh, changed the landscape a bit, okay. but not so much because mm -hmm. there have been criticisms so still applicable, but then now we have to make reference to um, the, the Constitution. Okay. So those, those are the, the broad um, uh, perspectives in terms of the framework mm -hmm. uh, within which international law applies in Kenya. But the fundamental rule is uh, for treaties and conventions, for them to apply here, they have to be ratified. Okay. Yes. Now, which brings the question about the judicial um, implementation of um, some of these um, laws and or even cases. Yeah. Because you know we we know that our judicial um, system, mm -hmm. from the magistrate court all the way to the apex court, that is the Supreme Court. When it comes to adjudication or um, implementation of some of these um, laws, yes. are they done within the context of our judicial system, or do we have cases of a, of a, of a special court to, to hear some of these issues, mm -hmm. especially when it borders, it borders say, um, the East African community or the African continent? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh the judiciary uh, generally also operates within a framework of laws, and the judiciary has the mandate to apply uh, the laws that um, uh, are enforced in Kenya. And, and, and so um, in terms of application of these laws, when it comes to the application and interpretation of international law, um, there has been a movement uh, since uh, before the 2010 constitution and after. Um, so in terms of application and interpretation of international law um, in Kenya, uh, before the constitution 2010, uh, the courts held view uh, that yes, um, international law would be part of our laws, but with very specific, uh, mm -hmm. within very specific confines. Mm -hmm. uh, in Kenya, the uh, sources of law are found in uh, Section 3 of what we call the Judicature Act, mm -hmm. which defines the sources of law in Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, the Constitution, legislation, and all that. Mm -hmm. In that definition, the international law was not part of it. Okay. And so because of that, um, the courts had taken the view that international law could only apply in Kenya mm -hmm. under very specific circumstances. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, they would only borrow interpretation from international law where there was either a gap mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in our legal system mm -hmm. or for purposes of interpretation mm -hmm. uh, where there was need, especially in human rights cases. Mm -hmm. But this moved when uh, the 2010 constitution was enacted that brought uh, international law straight into our legal system. Okay. Now that created a debate as to now the place of international law because yeah. the constitution whereas it says it forms part mm -hmm. it doesn't say in the hierarchy mm -hmm. yeah, where does it so. fall mm -hmm. uh, obviously the constitution is specific that it's the supreme law so mm -hmm. it doesn't come uh, before mm -hmm. the constitution mm -hmm. but after the constitution where we have legislation where does international law fall mm -hmm. is it after the statutes is it before or uh, do they apply uh, at the same level mm -hmm. with our statutes and that's a debate that is still out there because mm -hmm. the courts have um, decided differently on that issue. Mm -hmm. uh, while in certain cases, the courts have said that uh, uh, in international law um, is is 
um, up there. Mm -hmm. And to an extent where we've had case law, where the court in 2010 mm -hmm. um, uh, cited uh, certain provisions of international law. And uh, because of that indicated that certain provisions of our local uh, statute yeah. was unconstitutional simply because it was not in tandem with international law. Okay. But then other judges came after and they had completely different views mm -hmm. and they took the view that uh, international law would only be applicable mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that it agrees with the statutes okay. and mm -hmm. so they say that they apply at the same, at the same level. Mm -hmm. So there are different approaches that mm -hmm. the courts have given. Mm -hmm. uh, the interpretation and particularly that issue of the place of international law within the Kenyan um, legal system. But uh, at the end of the day, the most important thing is that international law is used lightly, especially in human rights cases, yeah. for the courts to borrow inspiration and make determination on human rights cases mm -hmm. in a way that ensures that uh, these rights are enjoyed and they're not curtailed. All right. Given um, what you, you, you said in terms of giving it a perspective on the approaches that have been done uh, previously, especially after the promulgation of the 2010 Constitution, uh, perhaps how can you gauge the application of international law, given that there has been some sort of a clash between which law is actually supreme? Does it mean then that um, the application has interfered with um, some of the treaties that we have signed to the extent that, yes, we have signed to be bound by these treaties, but when it comes to application, then that's where we, we, we drift apart. Um, yes and no. Um, in, in terms of international law and ratification of international law and how it operates, uh, the ratification is guided or governed by convention. Okay. Um, and this convention determines the procedure of ratification and the obligations of states when they ratify uh, these treaties and conventions. Mm -hmm. uh, the one fundamental principle in international law is called Vacta uh, Sunt Savanda, which says that states, when they ratify uh, treaties and conventions, they do so with the intention to be bound by those treaties and conventions and to implement them in good faith. Mm -hmm. And so whenever a state um, ratifies a treaty, the intention is that they will be bound and the intention is that they will implement them. Mm -hmm. uh, further, the states are um, given the obligation to ensure mm -hmm. that um, they come up with internal mechanisms to ensure that they can actually implement mm -hmm. international treaties and conventions. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, the understanding is that states are sovereign, and so how a state implements mm -hmm. it differs uh, from from the other. Mm -hmm. uh, a state chooses how they want to implement uh, international uh, law within their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, the question of courts and their place in the implementation of international law is very key, mm -hmm. and how the courts um, perceive international law affects um, the end result of that implementation process. Yeah. So that where the courts feel that uh, international law is uh, simply part of um, uh, inspiration, that it's not binding, then it becomes problematic when uh, they use it, uh, when parties approach the court and your main argument is based on an international instrument. Mm -hmm. um, but it's different when the courts understand that these international instruments are actually part of our laws and the same way we are implementing. And so I think so far um, our courts have implemented international law uh, mm -hmm. well. Uh, they have enforced uh, international law to and particularly when it comes to human rights issues. Mm. I think we are on the right course. All right. Yeah. Now, looking um, at the scenario that sometimes we might find a situation whereby um, international law or treaties um, will sometimes, you know, conflict with, with um, our our local laws, that is our constitution. Yeah. It, it, it um, 
gives us an impression that even in other states, they might have you know such scenarios. In a state, in a situation whereby two states are having a clash, and now the law to run into to, to run to is the international law, but then um, the international law that is being cited in this case sorts of clashes with the um, legal laws in their respective countries. How does that work out, or is it sorted from the onset of you know creating, uh, formulating, um, and drafting these particular laws? Um, when uh, it comes to issues of conflict, um, of, of laws, be it um, our own local legislation and international law, the rules that are applicable um, are, 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 are different in the mm -hmm. sense that application of law within Kenya, if we have a certain legislation and an international instrument and the two seem not to uh, okay. be in tandem, mm -hmm. uh, then that presents a bit of a difficult scenario as the courts have found themselves in. Uh, the constitution is supreme, so there can't be a question or argument about uh, any international instrument uh, conflicting uh, because obviously it would not be um, enforced. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to statute, um, courts have had a problem where they are faced with a scenario where one statute says something and the international instrument says another. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, and that has been since the promulgation of the constitution has been a problem. Yes. Um, the civil procedure rules allows um, uh, a judgment data uh, to. Um, enforce uh, their decree um, uh, by committing a, uh, the judgment creditor by committing a judgment debtor to civil jail okay. for six months mm -hmm. as a way of enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, there is an international instrument uh, called ICCPR. Um, uh, this is a convention on civil and political rights. Uh, it prohibits enforcement of debt by imprisonment. Mm -hmm. And so a question as to whether we should enforce the Civil um, uh, Procedure Act or we, we are supposed to enforce this international okay. instrument has been in court mm -hmm. and it's not yet settled because okay. the courts have had divergent views mm -hmm. on whether we should enforce this international human rights um, law oh, or we should go with our uh, local legislation which mm -hmm. allows uh, judgment creditors to take a judgment debtor to civil jail. Mm -hmm. And that remains unsettled because we have different uh, decisions mm -hmm. uh, from, 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 from the high court. Okay. And, and, and so when it comes to application locally, mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit um, murky at yeah. the moment. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to the international application mm -hmm. where two states are having a conflict mm -hmm. and so um, a state feels that their conflict is not, uh, they are not able to resolve it mm. at their level, mm. then uh, being members of the international community, they have avenues through which they can pursue mm. those conflicts. Okay. So for instance, um, the United Nations Charter um, gives the states a platform uh, within which they can settle their conflicts. Uh, so when you look at Article 93, one of the United Nations Charter, it specifies that all member states, by dint of being member states, mm -hmm. are actually members of the International Court of Justice okay. uh, statute, mm -hmm. which uh, the statute creates International Court of Justice that is supposed to settle disputes with, with, between states. Mm -hmm. So the states then have have a place to run to where two states feel that their conflict is not, uh, they cannot resolve it at their level, mm -hmm. then they can run to the ICJ, uh, file a case so that their conflict can be settled at that level. Right. So they still have uh, that option. Uh, once a state is taken to the ICJ, they can simply say uh, that our laws don't allow us. They're members of the international community. Mm -hmm. And so it would be in bad faith 
to ratify an international instrument, mm. then when you have a conflict with a neighbor, yeah. you want to rely on your own local legislation to mm -hmm. say that you cannot be taken to the ICJ. Mm -hmm. um, that, that would be in complete bad faith okay. uh, that the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, mm -hmm. uh, you know, frowns upon. All right. Yes. So, so what are some of the treaties and um, sanctions that we have signed into as a country which now forms a part of international law that governs us? And has it moved to uh, make our state, uh, you know, better as a nation? Yeah. Or has it moved to, some have said that some of these treaties that we, we, we get into sort of fix uh, mm -hmm. us as a state and as a continent due to the different interests mm -hmm. that, you know, our neighboring countries and the continents have? Um, we've had various arguments and discussions around the question of um, what influence the international community has on us locally and uh, particularly on the question of morals and those kind of issues. Mm -hmm. And at the point of uh, discussions um, before the promulgation of the constitution, actually just before the referendum, mm -hmm. um, different people took very different uh, standpoints on the direct applicability of international law in Kenya. And mm -hmm. they were uh, of the view that this will introduce all of these other things that we don't want, the yeah. vices, mm -hmm. uh, you know, LGBTQ issues yeah, that sure. have been here with us for uh, some time. Time. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we drafted uh, that particular clause, it was not left open per se. There are still arguments around that. But we said once we ratify. So as a state, we have um, the, the leeway to choose mm -hmm. which one we ratify. We look at our own setup and we look at which conventional treaty is going to be useful to us, which one we can um, implement within our own social setup, within our own environment. And so we only move to ratify mm -hmm. a, statu a, a treaty or a convention that will work in our favor. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't simply say that uh, the ratification of treaties opens us up to every other thing that comes with the international community. Um, I, th I think the fact that we have the freedom and the free will as a state mm -hmm. to ratify those that we choose to mm -hmm. uh, gives us that benefit of ensuring that whatever we ratify is something that would be beneficial to us. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so far, I think the trend has been that we've actually been mm -hmm. very picky in mm -hmm. terms of the treaties that yeah. we, we ratify. Mm -hmm. We've ratified quite a number of them, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in, in the area of, uh, of, of human rights mm -hmm. and a number of statutes that mm -hmm. we've, uh, we've, we've ratified. Of course, we are members of the United Nations, so the United Nations mm -hmm. Charter yeah. um, is, is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we are members of the African Union, mm -hmm. so definitely the African Charter on Human and uh, People's Rights. We are uh, members of the East African Community. So those are really the constitutive mm -hmm. um, uh, treaties and conventions that we've ratified. Under them, mm -hmm. there are then a number of other conventions that uh, uh, come up uh, at different times. Mm -hmm. And so we've also very selectively um, ratified a number of them along the way. Mm -hmm. They're quite, they're quite a number. Yeah. We may not be able to okay. go through um, uh, all of them. But right. I think we've been uh, pretty uh, selective in terms of ratification. All right. Thank you, Akili, for, for that perspective. Yeah. But we'll have to take our first break before we get back to look at the practicability of um, international law. We had, uh, as a mere principal, Mother Karua moved to EACJ to present the petition on the presidential election um, of 2022. We'll be having that discussion. Do stay with us. Sure 
by the year 2030, we have about 15 billion trees planted all over the country. And empowered by seeing how young people here are inspirational. You have some amazing activists within the community. You put the world to shame. The law, na kray may bagui, and the lakun rushia mawe, ivatolu koholi, katangozi yangu and entamorada munyakundu. It's happy when we hear that the ACC shares with us that the crime rate in Nairobi South B has reduced, courtesy of our joint programs with other youth groups. Focus on Health is a show that creates awareness on matters health and informs you on various diseases, their causes, treatment, prevention, coping and support. So join me, Bari Michelle, every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. only on KUTV. You can also follow us on our social media platforms at KUTV Focus on Health on Facebook and also on YouTube and Health Focus on, on Instagram because your health is your wealth. Stay safe and stay healthy. Kipindi hewani ni mitindo ya kipwani. Kama ilivo kipindi hiki, kina usu nyimbo. Nyimbo za tarab, chakacha, omidoara, omidundiko, bila kusahau mapishi. Mbao ndio uti wa mgongo wa pwani ya Afrika mashariki. Yamani swaibu zangu mliopo masikani. Hatuonani wenzangu. Najua mwanitamani. Hapa KU TV. Eh, nahoda muende sha chombo cha baharini yani. Uwa linalunukia na kubutia wa ready time. Welcome back. You're watching Law Matters. In case you're just tuning in tonight, we're looking into the issue of international law, its jurisdiction and implementation here in the country, and the progress that we have done so far after the promulgation of the 2010 Constitution. Now, um, Wakili, looking into the issue of implementation, now that you've um, given the discussion a perspective um, in terms of the progress that we have made so far, we had a, a recent case after the 2022 general election. The Supreme Court um, pronounced itself to um, declare uh, President William Bruto as the president-elect after a presidential petition was presented in court. And then we had um, the Azimio principal, Mother Karua, say, um, threatened to move to the East Africa um, Criminal Justice Court to seek a different opinion concerning the decision that the seven judge bench made um, or concerning that presidential petition. Mm -hmm. In that particular case, you've not seen um, progress in that case. You're not sure whether the petition was really presented, how far it is, but the much that we know is that he, uh, she made the intention. Mm -hmm. What happens when a petitioner takes a case to that particular court yet mm -hmm. within our jurisdiction? The Supreme Court is the apex and the most superior court. Yeah. Ah, thank you, Karen. Um, we have um, our own judicial system, uh, which ranges from uh, the tribunals to uh, the magistrate court, high court, all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is the apex court, as you rightly stated. Mm -hmm. That means that any person who has a grievance, um, they can only go as far as the Supreme Court uh, within uh, the country. Um, the issue you're making reference to is on election petitions and mm. specifically presidential yeah. election petitions. Again, yeah. uh, the Constitution specifically gives the uh, jurisdiction to handle uh, a, a presidential election petition mm. to the Supreme Court. So it means that any one aggrieved can only go to the Supreme Court and the decision of the Supreme Court is, is final. Yeah. Um, but then we understand that we have 
uh, be members of the East African community. And within the East African community, we have the East African uh, Court of Justice, mm -hmm. uh, which also deals with certain specific um, issues that mm -hmm. it has been given uh, the mandate um, to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, one of them is not a presidential election <laughs> petition, uh, but it deals with a myriad of uh, uh, issues, conflicts that come from the member states, mm. uh, part of them being uh, human rights violation issues. Mm. And so uh, the Azimio principle could have felt that uh, uh, there are uh, certain rights um, uh, were not um, properly um, addressed by the Supreme Court mm -hmm. at that point. So okay. they may feel that they want to draft a petition and file it at the East African Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. It would not be an election petition okay. uh, because the East African Court of uh, Justice cannot make a determination on mm -hmm. an, a presidential election mm -hmm. in Kenya. It's mm -hmm. not one of uh, those areas that mm -hmm. it would. But it can uh, make a determination on certain rights um, that a party says that, yes, I went to the Supreme Court, but I did not receive justice because the court did not consider one or two or three, mm -hmm. and therefore in the process uh, certain rights were violated. Mm -hmm. And so they want the East African Court of Justice to uh, render its uh, decision on those issues. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and whether or not the court should do that, the court also has its own um, powers to determine whether it has jurisdiction in the first place okay. to even deal with the issues presented okay. before mm -hmm. it. Um, but even if you were to go past that and the court uh, takes those issues and determines them, there is also now the question of applicability uh, or whether the decision can be enforced. Remember, uh, during the BBI debacle, uh, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court and um, Honorable Martha Cruz still felt that it was not um, uh, just. They didn't give a just determination. Mm -hmm. uh, and other parties who um, decided that they wanted to now take the matter to the East African Court of, of, of Justice. Mm -hmm. So um, the, a, a party would have um, the right to go to the East African Court of Justice, mm -hmm. uh, but the issues there must be confined to what that court mm -hmm. can we deal can with. Mm -hmm. And once that court deals with the issues, mm -hmm. the question of implementation or enforcement mm -hmm. back at home mm -hmm. is a completely different okay. uh, question altogether. Mm -hmm. and, and and that is largely, uh, you know, part of the uh, challenges of <laughs> international <laughs> law. Okay. You can go uh, to the uh, African Court on uh, Human Rights, uh, Human and People Rights, mm -hmm. People's Rights. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a decision, mm -hmm. uh, but then once you have that decision, to have it implemented here no. because you squarely depend on the state mm -hmm. um, to be able to enforce whatever you come back with. Mm -hmm. When you go there and your claim is that your rights have been violated by the same state, mm -hmm. then it becomes very difficult for you to eventually uh, get that decision implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, Was still, if the state feels that uh, uh, the international law ranks somewhere lower in the hierarchy of its own uh, of its own laws. Mm -hmm. um, so those are really some of the challenges that you come across. So yes. what is usually then the end game of um, some of the citizens in the country who present a case um, to the um, East African uh, Court um, of Justice or any other court? Because we also had the same scenario with um, the former Nairobi governor, Mike Sonko, who felt aggrieved by the Supreme Court's decision to decide that he is unfit to hold office. And then, you know, the first thought for them is we will run, you know, to the EACJ. Mm -hmm. But again, there are challenges and, 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 and um, loopholes in terms of how um, it can be implemented. Does it mean then it is in vain for us having that particular court, given that the implementation of the decisions they make cannot really apply given the interest of any particular country? Not necessarily. If we put it that way, then it would mean that we would encourage, uh, discourage people from uh, seeking mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. wherever they can find it. Mm -hmm. um, it is important that we encourage um, 
uh, people to uh, exhaust all remedies that they can find mm -hmm. uh, to be able to feel that justice has been served. Um, the challenge has been uh, that in the few cases we have cited, it comes out almost as if the filing of these cases at the East African Court of Justice is, is, is like an appeal against the decision oh, okay. of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which, which, which is, is not the case, yeah. should not be the case, mm -hmm. because the East African Court of Justice cannot handle appeals uh, from the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But parties have a right to approach the international courts uh, when they feel that certain rights have been violated, or if they feel that the state is not doing certain things that it should do. Mm -hmm. uh, it has the obligation under um, the, the, the treaty or convention or international law to do. Mm -hmm. And these are matters that such international courts should be able to adjudicate on, make certain declarations mm -hmm. and direct states mm -hmm. to rectify those issues and to do certain things that they may not have done. And, 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 and so parties should be free. Yeah. Um, the only thing is that it has to be done within the confines of certain laid down principles okay. so that when you want to approach an international court like the ESJ or you want to go to the African Court on Human and People's Rights, uh, there are certain things that you must satisfy. Mm -hmm. For instance, you must satisfy that you have exhausted all the local remedies. So you have to confirm that indeed these remedies were available. You've mm -hmm. tried your best mm -hmm. and you have not yet succeeded because mm -hmm. uh, the system has not allowed you to ventilate your case locally, okay. then you can approach uh, the international uh, or the regional court. Mm -hmm. But where you have um, gone through the court system as it's provided for, you've gone all the way to the Apex court mm -hmm. and the court has considered your issues but has arrived at a decision that you do not agree with. Mm -hmm. That in itself does not necessarily mm -hmm. uh, give you the right to, to go to the next court or to the international court. Mm -hmm. But on the question of enforcement, um, the, the issue ordinarily would be that a lot of times these courts would give certain declaratory orders. So you go and uh, claim that certain rights have been violated. The ESJ or the International Regional Court is supposed to make a declaration as to whether your rights have actually been violated and whether they can uh, make directions that you be compensated. Now, at the point of the corrective measure is where the challenge is, because you have a decision. You rely on the state that is not willing to implement it mm -hmm. to help you in the implementation. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that all is lost. We're just saying that uh, it then would depend on the goodwill. Uh, to be able to implement these decisions as they come okay. because the state also being sovereign, there's very little that the international regional court can do mm -hmm. to force the government to, uh, you know, do or not do uh, certain things. Mm -hmm. But definitely the fact that a determination has been made on that issue is a good step. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, we cascade the discussion further. We, we, we had... Um, the Kenya-Somalia Maritime Border, mm -hmm. a case that was presented in the International Court of Justice, um, the UN Court, yes. which then um, ICJ ruled in favor of Somalia, yeah. and um, the reti uh, retired President Uhuru Kenyatta at the time said that the, the ruling, they will not respect the ruling by um, that particular court. Mm -hmm. So what happens, given that we have signed treaties and charters you know, to ensure that we, we follow a certain procedure. Yeah. Um, thank you. The, the boundary dispute between Kenya and Somalia had been a greater volatile uh, kind of scenario. And at some point, um, then the Somali government decided that uh, as being members of the international community, we have an avenue. Mm. We take the case to the International Court of Justice mm. as, as, as they should mm. uh, because uh, the ICJ statute gives them being states the right to do, uh, to do, to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, they filed the case, uh, Kenya being the respondent. Um, Kenya filed an objection, um, objecting to the jurisdiction 
of the ICJ to determine the matter. Yeah. Um, and the ICJ has uh, uh, jurisdiction to, to, to determine its own jurisdiction, and so it determined that it actually has jurisdiction, and so the matter moved forward uh, now beyond the preliminaries to the court um, determining the substance. Uh, parties filed documents in court, um, exchanged uh, documents, and so it was at a point where the matter was ready for hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll recall that this was the time of COVID, yes. and mm -hmm. it came with a lot of challenges. Yeah. Um, and, and so the court, uh, the, the, the ICJ itself, had to adjust certain things mm -hmm. uh, to be able to accommodate the parties mm -hmm. within uh, that environment, uh, and it was difficult. So the dates had been pushed, and so there was a bit of a push and pull as to whether or not uh, the hearing could be extended at some point and Kenya insisted that uh, they wanted uh, the hearing to be pushed forward um, but the court uh, uh, insisted that the matter had been set down for hearing and mm -hmm. so the hearing had to proceed mm -hmm. um, and so on that basis Kenya decided no we are not going to participate in the hearing anymore uh, we, we will not be party to it mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, they had already exchanged all the documents. Mm. And so what was left was oral arguments mm -hmm. where the parties would uh, highlight the, the submissions uh, before the court. Um, and the court determined that now that Kenya has decided it's, it, it, it has waived its right to um, appear before it and present its oral arguments, uh, and Somalia agreed to proceed, um, they proceeded and the court then considered the written documents uh, that had been filed by both parties and of course the oral arguments that were presented by Somalia and uh, rendered its decision in which um, Kenya was not very happy with the outcome. Mm -hmm. So Kenya said we, we will not respect. Um, and there comes part of the challenges that mm -hmm. we have with, uh, with international law mm -hmm. uh, as to whether a state can simply say no, you have made that decision, we do not agree with it and we will not implement it. Mm -hmm. um, being a sovereign state, obviously, uh, th there's nothing much that you can do. But a decision has been made in the eyes of the international community, a decision has been made that the state needs to respect. And so the understanding is that the conflict at least should have been settled at that level. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. With that, we'll have to take our second break, but we'll be back with, with much, much more. Do stay with us. Fursa ya kutizama video zozote pindi tu unapokuwa na nafasi. Hiti za kukupa motisha, drama, maisha ya vio vikuu, teknolojia, masuala ya jamii, kuzuru maeneo tofauti, spoti, burudani na zaidi. Pata programu ya Lola sasa kwenye rununu yako kwa yote unayohitaji. What are some of the ways through which you can develop these skills so that you are comfortably fitting into the job? You have to put yourself in positions where you are uncomfortable. Uncomfortable in the sense that you are not clear about what to do. Because I used to work a corporate job before. So when I left, I happened to visit someone's farm around this area. So this project is called Security Breach De Detector and Planet Familiarize. It is meant to be used to detect detonate explosives. We we'll tackle all the tough issues, discuss all the weird moments, and hopefully share a few laughs along the way.
Thank you for staying with us. You're watching Law Matters in our final segment on this particular show, looking into the issue of international law and the issue of the jurisprudence, jurisprudence here in the country, I beg your pardon. Be sure to send your feedback on this particular discussion um, at KUTV Kenya on Facebook, at KUTV underscore Kenya on Twitter, and KUTV Kenya on YouTube. Now, Advocate Omiti, um, looking into what we discussed before we went um, on our short break uh, on what is happening on Kenya-Somalia maritime dispute, given that Kenya has decided we're not going to uh, be bound by this particular ruling, what happens given that the area that is in contention is rich with minerals and oil? So both countries will want to get into that, but a decision has been made. In terms of having war or a tussle, now who is the arbitrator that comes in given that one of the arbitrators, the decision they made, we, we, we don't feel comfortable with it? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, at, at the beginning, we should say that when parties um, sign contracts, um, I, I mean the treaties and conventions, um, the understanding at the international level is that they, are, um, they have made um, a declaration that they are willing and ready to be bound by them mm -hmm. and that they will apply them in good faith. Um, and so that goes to the entire spectrum of international law, which also includes decisions that come from the organs of international law, the ICJ being one of them. And, and, and so when a dispute is taken before the ICJ, the ICJ considers the d dispute and renders a, a decision on it. It's upon the parties to accept the decision to implement. Mm -hmm. Of course, that does not stop one party who feels this grant hold to say, ah, we're not in agreement with this decision and yeah. so we are not going to um, uh, implement it. Um, uh, if that happens, like Kenya has decided that they're not going to respect it, and Somalia, because they're happy with the decision, they're going to implement it. Um, the question of uh, goodwill of implementation of these uh, decisions mm -hmm. come into play. Um, the question of uh, sovereignty of a state and the decisions that it makes. But of course, sovereignty is like human rights, uh, where you write. Um, ends is where another person yes, begins and so you can't claim sovereignty to the extent that it affects another sovereign state and so Kenya um, might not uh, be happy with the decision but it, when it comes to implementation on the ground um, they are bound by that decision mm -hmm. um, and so if at all the issue continues then uh, there might be interventions by other organs like the United Nations Security Council to mm -hmm. make certain decisions if it becomes a security volatile situation okay. that um, uh, you know would go beyond affecting even just the two parties mm -hmm. to maybe other state parties that are not uh, okay. uh, part of this whole uh, uh, debacle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, yes, Kenya is bound by it. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they would respect it is a different question mm -hmm. altogether. Yeah. But uh, states getting to uh, these um, arrangements with the intention to be bound yeah. and with the intention to implement them in good faith. All right. Yes. Now, what happens in the scenarios that international law um, um, conflicts with um, culture mostly or um, the constitution of Kenya? And now I, I will cite the issue in Uganda um, in terms of the issue of the dicey issue of the LGBTQ rights. Yes. And we saw the IMF come into that discussion in what appeared to be um, the International Bank compelling mm -hmm. um, Uganda to be bound by um, certain human rights. Where do we find our, ourselves being placed in? I know the country have not um, gotten to that particular discussion, mm -hmm. but now how, how do we balance culture and, and international law and ensure we exist yeah. as, as a community? Um. Uh, culture is is, 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 is is normally a very emotive concept because it's personal um, and they are as different as as, as the humanity itself yeah. mm -hmm. um, and so we cannot uh, force uh, our culture on a, a different group mm -hmm. uh, but the 
international law operates in an environment uh, where we refer to as uh, civilized societies. So civilized societies then operate in a, an environment where certain cultures might be deemed as being repugnant mm -hmm. uh, to what we call justice and morality. And we say that if um, you want to uh, insist on a certain cultural standpoint, which in the totality of it doesn't look like it can operate in a civilized society, um, then it's important that you reconsider that position mm -hmm. because you operate within um, uh, this body called international community. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to implementation of international law, as we said before, countries decide which international mm -hmm. law to ratify mm -hmm. and how they want to implement it locally. And so if Uganda decides that, look, for us, we can only go to this extent when it comes to LGBTQ issues. It's a very dicey issue, but it's a decision that they have made as a sovereign kind of, uh, state, mm -hmm. and that decision um, ought, ought, ought to be respected mm -hmm. uh, because from their own viewpoint, uh, they, they have not outlawed LGBTQ, they are outlawing okay. certain yeah. issues. Okay. And, um, whether or not it's a good thing is a completely different uh, conversation, but mm -hmm. I think uh, the World Bank coming in to issue sanctions on the basis of that alone is a bit uh, stretched. Yeah. Um, uh, but of course we live in a society where uh, we, we should not be restrictive mm -hmm. um, to, the extent. to the extent that um, you know uh, there are certain segments of the society who cannot be allowed to Exist. live their lives yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now to bring the discussion to a close um, due to being pressed on time what are some of the recommendations that you would say should be put in place to ensure that um, we yes, exist as an international community by signing some of these treaties and some of these charters, but then again, we ensure that the independence of the, or the existence of a sovereign state is, is maintained because some of the times this conflict when it comes to um, the independence of a state when they get to, into signing some of these treaties. Um, states are never forced to, to ratify. Um, treaties and conventions. Um, it's a free will, it's a choice. Um, in ratification, there are certain treaties that uh, they can even partially uh, ratify. Okay. Um, and, 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 and so uh, there should not be a notion where we're saying that a state has been boxed into a corner mm -hmm. of <laughs> uh, you know ratifying certain uh, treaties and conventions. Uh, but the moment they have ratified them, then they should not also be had to be complaining that this is now oh. uh, not allowing us to exist freely mm -hmm. because before a state ratifies an uh, international instrument, they are um, assumed to have understood the full effect and uh, impact of that particular instrument mm -hmm. on, on, on itself as a state and on its people and they are supposed to do so to improve, um, one, the uh, relationship between itself and other states. And of course, domestically, they're supposed to also improve its own people mm -hmm. so that when it deals with human rights issues, then the understanding is that uh, they will enhance uh, the environment where human rights can be easily mm -hmm. enjoyed um, uh, by, by their people. Mm -hmm. uh, so states cannot say that we have been boxed, we are put in this in situation yeah. where there's nothing we can do because mm -hmm. we ratified a certain uh, treaty or convention. Mm -hmm. There are also um, instances where a state can decide that we are no longer interested in being part of that treaty mm -hmm. and they can work out. Mm -hmm. The process is a completely different mm -hmm. uh, ball game altogether to finally be out of uh, uh, that particular instrument. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they always have certain uh, clause that allows mm -hmm. states to say, yes, at the time we were ratifying it,
kutoka kwa jamii ya kuhamahama na sasa kujumuisha kilimo katika mitindo yao ya maisha kwenye toleo la kaunti ya Narok hii ni boresha kilimo kwani afya bora ni kilimo bora kwani kilimo ni boresha maisha Welcome back. You're watching Law Matters. Uh, tonight we're looking to the issue of international law and what is the legal framework here in the country. We are having um, Advocate Omiti. Of course, as we finalized before we took that particular break, um, can you tell us so how can we ensure that you know some of these um, cases that have been presented in the um, regional courts and you know um, the international court? people finally find an appeal or a, a, a place to find justice because even the 2007-2008 case by ICC, some felt like, you know, justice was not, you know, um, yeah. delivered. Uh, justice is, is, is a very um, interesting concept in that they, they, there are two aspects. Um, there is the procedural aspect and there's the substantive uh, justice. Um, when we decided to take the uh, post-election violence cases to the ICC, uh, we believed and trusted that the ICC had its own mechanisms uh, to investigate and to prosecute these cases to the logical conclusion. And the process kick-started. There were the investigations. We watched the proceedings on TV, the hearings uh, going on, and the ICC made a determination at the end of the day. Um, uh, uh, the uh, suspects were eventually acquitted. Yeah. Um, people had their own different views about the outcome of the case. Um, uh, and, and some felt that justice was not done. Mm -hmm. uh, but others also felt that justice was done. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the most important thing is that one, there was procedural justice, and number two, um, uh, that uh, as it appeared, 
the whole process to the very end, uh, justice could have been seen to have mm. been done. Okay. But people would still have different views. I mean, when you go to court, when you win, you feel justice is done. When you lose, you might feel it's not done. That's but the instances where you lose uh, and you're okay with it because you've seen that uh, it's been done properly. All right, so thank you, Advocate Omiti, for giving us a perspective. It was quite an interesting discussion to see um, how and what is the legal framework and what we can do better as a state, as a continent, as a region. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you for having me. All right, that has been Advocate Omiti, of course, you know, giving us a perspective concerning international law in Kenya. We believe that you have got to understand the thing uh, here, the concerning the jurisdiction of international law here in the country. My name is Aaron Mwangi. Thanks for watching and have a splendid night. This program is rated GE. Content carried in here is suitable for general family viewing. wanaogopa vituo vya afya kwa sababu wanaofia kuwa wakienda watapata ugonjwa wa corona ni nyakati zisizo na uhakika lakini zimeleta kampuni yetu kwa pamoja timu karibu na kutulazimisha kuzingatia kilicho cha muhimu ni muhimu kuwa na ujasiri wewe mwenyewe na kusema ni tafaulu kwa ari na shari na hata nikianguka chini nitasimama na kuendelea na mwendo Ugonjwa wa corona umezipa nafasi kampuni za za teknolojia uh, angalau uh, kujaribu uh, mingi kati ya huduma uh, zao uh, anzisho za teknolojia zinazoshughulikia afya na madawa zimekuwa na, na shughuli nyingi ya soko upande huu uh, biashara za kielektroniki na kwenye simu na pia uh, zimekuwa na shughuli nyingi haswa upande huu um, anzisho za kimilia za usafiri zimeathirika vibaya uh, na tumeona uwasilishi wa chakula nyumbani na vitu vinginevyo ume pia pia umeimarika uzuri wa teknolojia ni kwamba ni rahisi um, angalau kuwa na mfano Uh, kisha uh, kisha sio gali uh, kuna kuna uwezekano kwamba mapato uh, kuwa yamepungua uh, lakini uh, shughuli zimeongezeka corona imeathiri biashara zetu kwa sababu uh, baiskeli nyingi zilikuwa kwenye mashule hivyo uh, asilimia kubwa ya mapato yetu yalikuwa yanatoka shuleni Kaunti za boda boda zilikuwa kati ya asilimia kumi na kumi na tano ya uchumi wetu wa pato la taifa. Boda boda ndio wa kwanza uh, mwajiri wa pili mkuu wa vijana baada ya ukulima na hiyo inaashiria ama inaonyesha umuhimu wa boda boda. Madereva wetu walikuwa katika pali pali pagumu ambapo hawakuwa na mapato au mapato yao yalishuka kwa kiwango kikubwa. Pia uh, kama kampuni na wafanyikazi wetu wote sio wote walikuwa na uwezo wa kuendelea kufanya walichopenda. 
kama kampuni tulikuwa na mipango um, tuliokuwa uh, tulikuwa tumejitayarisha kutekeleza na mipango yetu iliweza kuadhirika ili ili tubidi kubadili lengo ili tubidi kubadili mtazamo ili ili tubadili mikakati kuhakikisha tunatoa huduma zetu Kampala na kwingine kwa wakati shughuli zimesitishwa za kawaida tulihisi tuko sawa um, our bike pia ina biashara nyingine mbadala our delivery ambayo huwa tunawasilisha mizigo na bidhaa kwa kutumia baisikeli zetu. Kwa hivyo kimsingi tulielekeza mtazamo wetu upande huo ambao tayari ulikuwa unafanya kazi pamoja na utumizi wa pamoja wa baisikeli uh, lakini uh, katika kipindi cha covid na kusitishwa katikuli za kawaida tuliweza uh, kusafirisha bidhaa zaidi kwani uh, usafiri wa baisikeli ulisitishwa tunajikaza tuwezi kudhubutu kusema tunaendelea vyema kwa sababu covid uh, uh, imetuweka pali pabaya zaidi sana kama nilivyosema hapo awali uh, tuweza kubadili mikakati sana na kuzingatia wasilishaji tukishirikiana na UNCDF tuliweza kujumuisha masoko na biashara zote Kampala kwa jukwaa letu mkitambo maderevu wetu angepata kati ya 1050 na 70 kwa siku leo maderevu wetu wanapata kati ya shilingi 1010 na 1015 kwa siku bila shaka kwa kutumia jukwaa letu la wasilishaji wanaweza kupata mapato zaidi na tunaendelea pia kuhudumia wakazi wa Kampala kwa kutumia ubunifu wetu zaidi na hivi majuzi tumeshirikiana na UNFPA kuendelea kuhudumia watu ambao wamesitishwa katika shughuli zao za kawaida wanaohitaji bidhaa za kibinafsi kama kiafya huko Uganda tumekuwa na wengi walioweza kutoa suluhisho tuna vijana wengi ambao wameleta suluhisho za uwasilishaji kwenye mtandao Uh, uh, wasilishaji wa nyumbani tunao uh, vijana wetu wanarika wetu ambao wako kwa safe boda boda ambao wameongeza wasilishaji kwa sababu hapo awali safe boda boda ilikuwa inafanya safari tu tulipokumbwa walianza kuitengo cha wasilishaji tuna mikahawa kama vile Java hivi sasa wa, wanafanya wasilishaji wanawasilisha nyumbani hiki ni kitengo muhimu sana siku hizi kwa upande wa makadirio yetu ya siku za usoni tuna matumaini uh, kwa sababu Watu zaidi wanazidi kukubali um, uendeshaji wa baisikeli. Um, la pili um, uendeshaji wa baisikeli ndio mbinu ya usafiri inayoendana na COVID kwa sababu unaweza um, kuweka umbali unaostahili 